Uh, this evening, the, the theme for uh, the, uh, the talk, uh, in discussing with uh, Irene and others here, uh, we decided on uh, Buddhism and mindfulness in the West, uh, and uh, what, uh, uh, say what are the prospects uh, and what are the, the challenges that uh, accompany these? Uh, what can we look forward to or what direction are they heading in? So uh, uh, we'll explore this uh, theme a little bit, offer a few reflections, perspectives on this uh, from my own point of view, and then we'll have a time to uh, have discussion, open things up and to hear your own views, your own uh, perspectives, and to ask any questions that you might like. So uh, when we consider, say, mindfulness, Buddhism and mindfulness, uh, where are they headed? Uh, the, um, the first response that comes to my mind is, good question. <laughs> because, of course, uh, the future is unknown, is uncertain, uh, but we can possibly see various <coughs> trends and threads that are, are say, uh, taking shape already and, uh, <coughs> and uh, projections that we can make into the future. One uh, small caveat that I, I would make is that uh, sometimes things that seem to be very obvious trends and uh, a, a powerful direction, sometimes they can collapse and then uh, things that seem to be small or tangential or insignificant can turn out to be the, the defining or the dominant quality. You know, the, uh, the, uh, there's a few examples, uh, say Theravada Buddhism as we know it today is a was just one of many uh, uh, groups. Uh, I'm sure there's a few Buddhist historians in the room. I can challenge my, my uh, uh, modest knowledge of Buddhist history. But because of the, the school uh, uh, that spread to Sri Lanka, uh, Ceylon, or Tambapani as it was in those days, that uh, uh, in, within that island culture, a particular strand of, of Buddha Dhamma was sustained and then uh, has sort of informed what we now call Theravada Buddhism, which is the, the Buddhism of the the southern Asian world uh, all these centuries later. But at the time, it was just one of many different schools, so that it was not particularly dominant, uh, as I, I understand it. Or uh, even going further back into history, at the end of the era of the dinosaurs, the, the uh, mammals are our physical ancestors, uh, small rodent-type creatures. They were the ones that survived the, uh, uh, the effects of a meteorite striking the Earth. and that. Uh, made it through after the, the era of the dinosaurs came to an end. They made it through, they found ways to adapt and survive, and then here we are. These are our ancestors. Strange as though it might be to consider that. So that's a, a caveat in terms of the, th the, the themes or threads that we see today might not be the defining um, qualities into the future, but um, the... Uh, uh, the best that we can do is to, to look at the world, to look at the picture as we see it now and to say, uh, extrapolate a little bit and also to use that extrapolation, that way, that say, uh, forecasting to help us make uh, skillful decisions and to guide things in a, a helpful way here in the present. So, uh, In considering this whole field and uh, also having lived most of my life as a, a Buddhist monastic in the West uh, you know, since uh, the end of 1979, so nearly 40 years living in the West, the, uh, this question of um, bringing the uh, Buddhist teachings and how they can function usefully in the Western world has been so very much the center of my whole adult life. So I've been close to this question uh, for many years. Also being a, a kind of card-carrying, uh, flag-wearing uh, traditionalist, uh, uh, I've been very much part of, of, uh, of an orthodox order and uh, say, uh, a group of people taking a, um, uh, a method of practice and a way of life that uh, is uh, very strongly informed by classical models, classical forms. But uh, along the way, I've also been collaborating with and connecting with and, and um, offering teachings to people who have not been using the classical forms in such a, a, a way, not robe-wearing or... Um, not uh, living according to the Vinaya discipline. And so that there's a, uh, over these years, there's been a, a constant dialogue between the, the forces of, uh, say, traditionalism or um, the, <coughs> the reference to the classical forms and um, the, the endeavor to be authentic and to be sincerely representing those classical models uh, and the, so the endeavor to be authentic in, in respect to the origins of the, the uh, tradition and the Buddhist teachings, 
but also to be in a, a constant um, mode of adaptation. Uh, the, the Buddha Dharma is, a, is a, a living teaching, a living tradition, and uh, it uh, adapts to and needs to, to be able to work with the, within the environments in which it is established and being practiced. So there's a dialogue that's, that's been going on for many decades now uh, between adaptation and authenticity. Uh, this is a simple way of, of, of phrasing it. And, uh, <clears throat> and so that uh, over the years, many, many Buddhist conferences and dialogues and, and interactions uh, leading events together. Sometimes it'd be a, a lay teacher in a monastic or sitting in on uh, conferences where, like just in, in July of this year, I was at a, a, a conference on mindfulness in Amsterdam. Uh, 600 uh, delegates to the conference, one person in robes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> So, uh, <clears throat> okay, this is not completely my territory, but I also uh, being able to, to say, be in an, an environment, environment like that and not feel completely like a fish out of water, but as still having a sense of uh, belonging and affiliation and affinity with the people there. Also, I was invited to give a talk about stream entry, which is one of the reasons why I, I uh, <clears throat> attended the conference. And I thought, well, if you have 600 academic psychologists and therapists and researchers who want to hear about stream entry, that's a, an interesting sign of the times. Um, so when I, uh, uh, when I speak about auth authenticity, that's not just referring to being, uh, say, uh, representing classical forms or ancient traditions, like the, the robes, the shaven head, the uh, adherence to the Vinaya discipline. But uh, I feel it's also important to, uh, if we're talking about authenticity, to see that uh, uh, if we need to be authentic, if we, if we want to say follow the Buddha's teaching, in terms of his pragmatism. The, the Buddha was bringing a teaching into the world that was a revolutionary teaching in many respects. And uh, uh, the, uh, that, say, transformative quality of the teaching, it wasn't just a belief system, it wasn't just another set of customs or forms or rituals, but rather it was a set of tools that he brought into uh, Indian society uh, of... Uh, <clears throat> the subcontinent in that era in order to help people to transform their lives. That's what it was for. So part of authenticity is not being sort of an authentic monk, you know, or just by uh, following the forms, reciting Pali suttas, and carrying out the traditions and rituals of, of the ancient times. But I feel authenticity is also, uh, say, strongly con connected with how useful are you? How, uh, how much can these, your, your life, your teachings, what you do, how you are, how can that be uh, of practical benefit to the people that you encounter? When people are, are meeting you, they're, they're drawing upon your tradition or your teachings, that <clears throat> to, to what degree can that benefit their lives? So that being authentic in terms of the, the practical results of these teachings. So uh, I, I feel when we, we talk about that dimension of things, it's important to recognize there's a authenticity in relationship to form and uh, classical structures, but also authenticity in terms of the spirit and the intention behind the Buddha uh, teaching and uh, making the effort that he did to establish the monastic orders, the, the fourfold assembly of, of uh, lay disciples, lay women, lay men, and um, the, uh, the monastic communities of, of uh, nuns and monks that uh, he spent all those years, uh, 45 years, of his teaching career, um, bringing that all together and establishing that in a, in a way that could sustain itself over, over long periods of time. So then uh, if we, uh, we look at the, the way things have been progressing, I, personally, uh, obviously my, my perspective is biased, but I see that for Buddhism and mindfulness, as uh, I would uh, <coughs> say, I would be presumptuous enough to say that's an offshoot of Buddhism, <laughs> that there are other mindfulness trainings that have come out of different traditions to, to certain degrees. I wouldn't say Buddhism has the monopoly on, on mindfulness, but it, that's, its presence in the world, particularly in, in the West, in this current age, has very directly sprung from particularly John Kabat-Zinn's experience and practice, his life, his work, which is very directly informed by, by Buddhist practice. In fact, uh, at a conference here in San Francisco in 2013, he said, quote unquote, I've always used the word mindfulness as a placeholder for dharma, quote unquote. So that uh, 
So that quality of, um, of Buddhism and mindfulness, I feel there's a, a lot of, of very powerful benefits that this has brought and is bringing, and I can see continuing to bring uh, uh, many, many benefits into society. Nowadays, there, there's a, 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 what you might even refer to as an, ec an epidemic of uh, mental uh, health uh, problems, a lot of, uh, particularly depression and um, anxiety. The, uh, according to the statistics that I've been shown, there are double the number of work days lost per year around the globe from depression than any other kind of injury or illness. So it's not just a, a, a personal issue, it's an economic issue as well. So more than double the number of, so, uh, of work days lost around the world from heart disease, hand injury, eye injury, back injury. Uh, depression is the cause of more work days lost and is a, is a, a huge um, social issue. In, in the UK this year, uh, just a, a month or so ago, I saw an ex extremely shocking statistic. Again, this is, you know, I, I don't know how well substantiated it is, but it was said um, in a reputable newspaper that 40% uh, of girls in England between the ages of 13 and 16 had received some kind of psychiatric help or advice, had sought psychiatric treatment of some kind. 40%. That's a staggering number to me. And so that that's saying that uh, four out of every ten uh, teenage girls of that age uh, in the UK have needed to go to some kind of counsellor or therapist or psychiatrist or, or school uh, medical assistance that says, I need help. Uh, my mind is, is uh, in such a state. Uh, I need support. I need help. I can't handle my mind. I, my life is too painful, too difficult. I need help. So uh, just, just as one example. So I feel that um, mindfulness and Buddhism... Buddhist meditation in particular in the Western world is doing a wonderful job, is doing great service in providing resources that can meet those kind of difficulties. Um, uh, obviously this is blowing our own trumpet a little bit, but uh, when the, uh, the, the, the work to develop mindfulness-based cognitive therapy for depression was developed by John Teasdale, Mark Williams, and Zindel Siegel, um, in, uh, in the 2000s, about, I think they were about uh, 10 years ago or so. Uh, I think it was um, uh, 2007 or so where there's a major a paper was published on this when they first produced results that showed that um, they, uh, this method of uh, working with the mind, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, which is directly informed by Buddhist meditation practices, that uh, whereas if someone had a, a, a repeated uh, instance of depression, the prior to, to 2000, uh, 2007, when they began to use this, uh, I'm not 100% accurate about the, the dates, but around that, the, the, the most successful methods for treating recurrent depression had a 5 to 10% recovery rate. So if you had had a, a, more than one uh, episode of depression, you were 90 to 95 percent likely to have it come back again. Whether you had therapy, whether you had psychoanalysis, whether you had shock treatment, whether you had medication, and no treatment had a better than 10 percent recovery rate. When they began to use mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, they had a 50 percent recovery rate. According to the, the narrative I heard about this, when they first published this study, the rest of the academic community said, rubbish. You've botched your results, this can't be right. You can't be 500% better than anybody else. This is just, this is fallacious. You've, you've fudged your statistics. You, you, you must have a, a made a, a big mistake or you're just you know, wrong. So they, they did that initial study in the UK. They repeated it in the USA. They got the same results. That's when interest in mindfulness started to kind of go into the, the hockey stick. <laughs> it started to escalate because this was a, a massively uh, impactful, uh, say, uh, approach. So obviously it's not going to solve all the world's problems, but I feel this is one indication of how uh, mindfulness and Buddhist meditation uh, can have an extremely uh, meaningful and direct impact on society, and I feel very positive uh, about that. The uh, acceptance, another of the positives uh, that, uh, in terms of direction, is that um, a number of government bodies, like the, there was a book published here in the US, a Mindful Nation, uh, by a, a US senator, um, which is kind of surprising. <laughs> but uh, a US senator published that, and then they, there was a follow-up uh, with a similar title in the UK, 
uh, Mindful Nation UK, which is a, a publication that was supported by the uh, United Kingdom government. And uh, they, uh, the, this was describing an, uh, programs, the effect of programs in the academic field, uh, in, say, in education, in mental health, physical health, criminal justice, and in the business world, and uh, of introducing mindfulness trainings in these different domains and how they had brought particular benefits. And to my amazement, they, they said that 20% of members of parliament had signed up and put their names on this, which is a, a, a huge amount of support uh, to, in my mind. Um, and that, and those num that number of, of members of parliament, the leaders of the government, would stick their name and say, yes, this is something I support, this is a good thing. They're not saying I'm a Buddhist uh, or, uh, or becoming a you know, robe-wearing, shaven-headed uh, uh, traditionalist, but I feel that's a, a wonderful sign that uh, a, a government, uh, uh, can, in a bipartisan way, can pick up these, these trainings, these methods, and say, this is something that the, the nation will be benefited by, and we're happy to put our, name on, our names on it and support it to be, to be developed. So I feel that and that's a very positive sign. I feel also that uh, in terms of, of positive aspects of, of mindfulness and Buddhism, this is the sweet spot. We're in the Goldilocks, if that's not politically incorrect nowadays, I'm not sure. But the Goldilocks period uh, for, for Buddhism in the West and, uh, because it, you are probably unlikely to, to get a lot of votes by calling yourself Buddhist. It's not like if you're born into a Buddhist family, that'll get you you know, get you an inn at Stanford, or <laughs> maybe it will. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, it's not, it doesn't carry a huge social cachet. It's not particularly, it doesn't carry any weight. We're, we're outliers, we're, we're kind of fringe dwellers. Uh, it's not an established religion uh, in the West in any, kind of, in any particularly strong way. So where it's present, but <clears throat> we're, we are, we are pa basically politically powerless. So this is great. I feel that um, it's where the, the teachings are available, the, the practices are available, there are good teachers around, there are good amenities and facilities like here in the Bay Area, you have thick on the ground, the, from the, not just the Theravada tradition like the, uh, uh, the um, Insight Meditation Center, Gil Fronstel's place, uh, or Spirit Rock, but also Zen tradition, you have Zen Center, uh, Tassahara and Green Gulch, you have Tibetan centers, um, many, many different traditions. So that um, these, uh, uh, these are places that are, have a practical benefit and there's not a, um, a kind of major social, uh, say, uh, uh, weight that they carry, if you understand what I mean. So that the teachings are here, they're present, they're, they're practiced in, in sincere ways. Most of us as Westerners were not born into Buddhist families. Most of us have come into Buddhist meditation and Buddhist practice, practice of mindfulness out of a, pra a pragmatic need, a pragmatic interest. So we're not doing it out of uh, re inheriting a tradition or a form from our ancestors, our parents. We're doing it because it helps. We're interested, we're putting energy and effort into it because it helps. In a hundred years time, I will predict, then there are going to be Buddhist families and it is going to carry a weight. You know, you are going to be able to sort of present yourself as a Buddhist and that's going to get you elected because it's, a, <laughs> it's, a, it's, kind of, it's, a, it's a, a big point to, to sort of put on your resume. Like, you know, having a PhD from, from Stanford, it's like, oh, really? You know, then that gets someone's attention. Or, the, or you come from, a, you know, a Kennedy family, or, that, or you're, you're a Bush, you know. The name carries some weight. Or you, went, you got a DPhil from Oxford University. Oh, really? Yeah. And uh, so in 100 years' time, I, I suspect that Buddhism will have put its roots down and it'll carry that kind of social weight. But it doesn't at the moment. And personally, I feel that's a really good thing to be an outsider, to be a freak. Yeah. I was always quite comfortable looking a bit strange, <laughs> so, but I feel just uh, rather than feeling uh, that, uh, uh, that necessitates shaving your head and wearing a robe, I feel it's, a, it's a really an advantage to be an outlier, to, to be able to use these practices, these traditions, in a very uh, uncluttered way, you know, and to relate to them not because um, it's, a, it's got an inherited value system, but because the qualities that, that the meditation and the practices, the teachings possess are a direct benefit and you can test that out and, and know that for yourselves. It's not just got an inherited or an assumed value, but its value is coming from one's own experience. So I think, you know, make hay while the sun shines. 
be glad that you've been born in this particular period. You might, be, of course, be born again in the future period. But <laughs> I won't go into that. But, <laughs> but uh, I would say this is a precious time, uh, that uh, a really good opportunity where these amenities, these teachings, these practices are available, and they, they're not cluttered up by having uh, a great social weight. Having been trained in Asia, say in Thailand, where Buddhism has been established for about 800 years in a solid way, other Buddhist countries where it is an ancient tradition, it, they carry a lot of weight. That uh, When I walk around dressed like this, I, mean, I don't have any other clothes. These are my clothes. I don't have jeans. So. <laughs> the, uh, you know, I always walk around dressed like this. If you're in the West, you're a bit of a freak. You know, people kind of come up to you and say, well, what are you? I mean, nowadays they'd say, oh, are you from Thailand? Uh, but uh, <clears throat> you're a bit of a freak. You're a bit of a strange thing. You, know, you can stand on the tube and just people will the underground train on the Bart and people just sort of squash up against you and not think twice about it. If you're in Thailand, if you get onto the, under, if you get onto the, the, the train there, then people will be on the ground, hands in, in Anjali, kneeling and say, oh, please, have a seat. You know, how can I get out of the way? Can I bring you a cold drink? You know, you're, a, you're a rock star. You know, you're a, <laughs> you're a, you're a, as a monk, you're a deity. And there's a, a huge amount of assumed value just in wearing a robe and being a monastic. And that's... It, it can be enjoyable, <laughs> but uh, it also there's an, an automatic assumed worth just by carrying the, the credentials, by wearing the, the robe. And that, uh, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I feel it's, it's, uh, it's helpful um, to be in a time where the, that it doesn't have that weight of, of custom and tradition and ancestry behind it, but its, it's appearance is very fresh and, and alive. The, um, uh, another of the, the positive aspects um, is that uh, uh, the, uh, the approach of the Buddha is a very experimental approach. Rather than uh, him saying, you know, I'm telling you the absolute truth and you should believe it, one of the most significant uh, say, teachings that uh, caught the attention of the European intelligentsia back in the 19th century and, and even earlier was that the Buddha said, uh, don't believe things just because they're told to you by spiritual authorities. Don't believe things just because they make logical sense or because uh, the, your, um, your family follow these customs and, and have these beliefs. But take a teaching, try it out, see if it's beneficial for yourself. So that's a very, that fits in very much with the scientific ethic. Uh, don't, you have a null hypothesis, you, you kind of create an idea, you try it out, you see whether it works or not. What's the result of that? So the fact that the, the Buddhist approach, uh, right from the very beginning, and its, it's, it's very ethos, fits in with that Western scientific method, I feel is another way that makes it very accessible. So therefore, um, say for example, at, uh, at, our, at Amravati Monastery, we have a very, very broad uh, and eclectic group of people who come to regular retreats and, and classes. So uh, it's not, uh, certainly not just uh, Asian people, but certainly uh, uh, many, many Westerners and Middle Easterners uh, whether, uh, and the, whether people happen to come from a Buddhist background or a Christian background or an atheist background or a Muslim background or a Hindu background. Uh, we have uh, people from all different uh, religious, uh, uh, say, ancestries and uh, dispositions coming to meditation classes. And the way that we teach classes is that, uh, and this was Ajahn Sumato's, say, insistence right from the beginning. He said, don't assume that the people who come through the door want to be Buddhist. <laughs> Uh, but th they want to have a, 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 an instruction in how to make their mind more peaceful, how to understand their life, how to live more skillfully. So don't teach in a way that uh, assumes people want to be a Buddhist or that they're fed up with being a Muslim or a Christian or, or that they're they, they, they going to be benefited by, by shedding their old religion and becoming Buddhist. No, it's important to speak in a way that completely respects people's own preferences in terms of religious uh, disposition, spiritual inclination, or lack of it. And so it's, uh, that's one of the great strengths, I feel, of Buddhism and the mindfulness uh, teachings is that they can be put across completely faithfully to their sources, faithful to the, the, the Buddha's word, without saying, uh, if, you were, if you were wise, you would think like me. <laughs> you know, if, you, if you want to really straighten out your life, be a Buddhist like me. But rather, here are some tools that you can use, whether you're a practicing uh, Christian or a Hindu or a Muslim or, or you're a skeptical materialist. Fine, these tools work just the same. Like water comes out of the tap and it's water, whether you're a Muslim or a Christian or a Hindu or you're a, 
uh, uh, you're from Alpha Centauri, you know, wherever you're from is still water. So that the, the Buddha's teachings function in a very practical and accessible way. So the, in terms of the um, challenges and obstacles, of course there are, they are many and various. <laughs> and uh, so uh, in terms of, of mindfulness and Buddhism, um, one of the ongoing uh, issues and discussions is commercialism, the, the marketing of the Dharma. And uh, I've been in many, many <laughs> conversations and uh, uh, say discussions uh, with uh, different uh, groups and different individuals uh, over the years. And uh, again, I feel we are somewhat in the sweet spot. So even if people who try to market Buddhism, it's not that marketable. <laughs> it's not a kind of a hugely um, uh, sort of compelling consumer item. But still, it, it's, it is drifting in that direction. And so you, sometimes you'll see uh, meditation courses or seminars or, or mindfulness programs that do make kind of outrageous promises. You know, just do this course, pay $5,000 for this weekend and... You know, you'll be, uh, your life will be changed forever and you'll be uh, happy and liberated, enlightened and so on. I mean, these are sweeping statements and I'm not quoting adverts verbatim, but I think we probably all come across those kind of uh, pieces of literature and promises. So I do feel that's an uncomfortable drift and also the, the commercializing of Dharma that uh, when things have a big price tag on them, then they have to be dressed up in a way that makes them interesting, sexy, attractive, and so that uh, sometimes the, um, the, the challenging aspects of the teaching, the, the teachings that, that uh, say, point to your, um, uh, your opinions, your, uh, your, your sort of middle-class materialist value systems, <laughs> that the, the, the teachings that challenge that, or your attachment to your appearance, uh, your wealth, um, then that can be uh, something that is trimmed out because it, it, it doesn't help the seats to get filled at your events. So that uh, that uh, I feel is a, uh, a is an ongoing dialogue, but I feel it's a weakness. The degree to which uh, the challenging teachings or the, the te teachings that are not quite so attractive or appealing um, kind of get uh, edited out or, or, or left um, in the, the fringes, and so it can weaken the teaching. Many years ago, when uh, Ajahn Chah, our, uh, our teacher from Thailand, was visiting. The, U the one time he visited the USA in 1979, uh, he was invited to teach uh, during a 10-day retreat at uh, Insight Meditation Society in Massachusetts. And uh, he, w uh, he was asked to give advice to the, the teachers there, Jack Cornfield, uh, Sharon Salzberg, uh, Jackie, uh, Jackie Schwartz, Jackie Mandel, is, uh, I think she goes by now, uh, Sharon Salzberg, and jo Joseph Goldstein. And... Uh, they asked Ajahn Chah to give them advice as teachers. And uh, one of the comments that he made, he said, um, you will succeed only if you are prepared to challenge the, the, um, the, uh, the attachments and obsessions of your students. The, the Thai phrase is literally, if you're ready to stab their hearts. <laughs> so he had a good way of getting people's attention. <laughs> so so if, you, if you don't do that, so, uh, because... That's the, that's the kindness of the teacher, is in being ready to, to point out things that uh, the students are deeply attached to, and, and particularly the things they really don't want to let go of. <laughs> that's the job of the teacher, that's the kindness of the teacher. So like, probably there's a few doctors here, a few surgeons. You know, how could a surgeon operate if you didn't use a knife occasionally? I mean, there's a lot of microsurgery now, but you need the knife sometimes to get to the, the, where, where the trouble is. And so that was uh, pointed, pun intended, advice from, from uh, Ajahn Chah that, uh, <coughs> that the, the kindness of the teacher sometimes needs to manifest itself in telling, uh, uh, giving advice that is, is painful or challenging and goes against the, the preferred version of reality of, a, of the student. Uh, another story uh, that comes to mind is um, uh, a friend of ours, uh, Tsokni Rinpoche, who's a Tibetan lama, he would refer to this kind of uh, the editing the way uh, of, uh, of uh, approach to Dharma practice according to your own preferences. Uh, with present company accepted, he called this California Dharma. <laughs> <laughs> How, like, yes, I, I'm, I, I see you know, all, thing, all, all things are empty, nothing is worth attaching to, but I just like my comforts, you know. It's just I'd like to have a few beautiful things around. I'm not attached, but, you know, I just like to have a beautiful home and a nice view kind of picture window in Marin County over the bay and you know, 
<laughs> I'm not attached, I'm not attached. So he was, uh, he was in this particularly beautiful house uh, in Marin, <laughs> and his host was a very, very wealthy family, and uh, it was talking in these terms. And so then uh, Rinpoche picked up this coffee pot that was sitting on the table, and he kind of started tilting it, and he said, how much did this carpet cost you? It was like a handmade Turkish carpet. And the guy said, about $35,000. He said, um, so t tell me about your non-attachment. <laughs> and he's kind of tilting the coffee pot a little bit more, a little bit more. He said, so you, know, you say you really like this place and you, you enjoy having beautiful things around, but you're really not attached. So uh, how not attached are you? And he kind of tilting the another, another two degrees, another three degrees. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> I'm attached, I'm attached. Just, don't spoil the carpet. You know. So uh, I thought it was a very practical teaching. That's, a, that's also the kind of teaching that you get from the Thai forest Ajans as well. That, that very to the point. So that kind of uh, trimming and editing of the Dharma teachings to fit people's preferences and opinions um, and that it's not challenging. Um, I feel that's, that's a weakness that is happening in the West. And uh, particularly, um, uh, and it's a, I'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment, with respect to mindfulness teachings and the absence of teachings on ethics, the, the deliberate uh, leaving out of teachings on sila, on, on ethics, uh, say the, the five ethical uh, uh, precepts that the, the Buddha established for, as guidance for the lay community, um, that's very deliberately left out of the mindfulness trainings, mindfulness-based stress reduction, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. Uh, and I've had long discussions uh, and correspondence with John Kabat-Zinn, friendly, <laughs> uh, and also uh, not so much with Mark Williams, but uh, who is um, also had been uh, one of the founders of MBCT, and uh, they uh, both speak very strongly in terms of the, the need to, to leave ethics as uh, implicit rather than explicit in terms of those trainings. So I, I, I brought along a little um, piece I'd like to read out with in relationship to that, um, but I, I feel that's uh, something that is a, it's not a rich and ongoing discussion within that field about whether uh, ethics should be articulated or not. Uh, but I personally, my, my own biased, probably biased opinion is that it's a, it's a weakness and it will be much more helpful uh, uh, to be more explicit, spelling things out in terms of what really benefits us as human beings. And I would say that uh, ethical guidelines, uh, the precepts, can be articulated and, uh, and held without it being sort of religious diktats or sort of Victorian um, uh, up, sort of uptight formalism, but rather uh, as you know, skillful guidelines for, for living carefully. Uh, the uh, other shortcomings or challenges, I feel, is the ongoing meshing of ancient traditions and sort of patriarchal Asian uh, societal forms into a, an egalitarian uh, Western society. So that's a, an interesting mix. <laughs> uh, you know, we have to bear in mind that the Buddha was teaching 2,500 years ago. That was the Iron Age. I mean, I, I realize that uh, the, this is a kind of a European way of speaking because uh, West Coast America, the, you know, they didn't, uh, the native peoples didn't even uh, uh, forge iron, to my, to my knowledge, in this part of the world. It was a, a stone culture, and uh, stone and, and wicker work and and such like. But I even in, in Europe, that was the Iron Age <coughs> when the Buddha was teaching. It was a long time ago. <laughs> and so the, the, the forms that you have in traditional Buddhist societies, say in, in Thailand, in Sri Lanka, in uh, Myanmar, in China, in uh, Japan, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, uh, Nepal, uh, and uh, the, um, uh, into Mongolia, uh, and, uh, and, uh, Siberia, and so forth. The, the, the forms which have been the body of Buddhist practice and uh, the, the presence of the Buddhist community in society, they have been uh, uh, formed over many, many centuries. And so taking that and whoomph, <laughs> planting that into Western society, there's uh, a lot of challenges in that, and that uh, in terms of adaptation and what to keep, what not to keep, how to, how to adapt things, how to change things. 
And so that's an ongoing dialogue. And I, 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 and I say, in some respects, it's, it's a weakness or it's a challenge because some things don't fit very well in terms of the, uh, the kind of customs and traditions, the superstitions and, uh, and forms. And, uh, and so that they, uh, uh, they don't work very well. They're, they're an uncomfortable fit in Western society. Other things do fit well, but they're just really unfamiliar. They're, they're really unfamiliar and strange to our, our perceptions. So that's, uh, for myself, in my own community, has been an, uh, a very rich and ongoing dialogue. Uh, it's quite notable that when, when Ajahn Chah first came to, to teach, in, uh, and he told, uh, uh, he received an invitation from a group in London to uh, go and visit their, their little monastery in, in, uh, in Hampstead, on Haverstock Hill in London. And uh, when he agreed to accept the invitation and told Ajahn Sumedho and a few other monks they should stay there, he said, you can change the robes if you want to, you can change the chanting, you, you can adapt those, this is a cold country, um, you can adapt those if you, uh, if you want to, if you need to, but you have to go out on arms round every single day. And so they thought, well, oh, that's kind of strange. I thought he'd be really insistent on the robes and, and on the, the, the ritual forms, but why go on arms round? Who's going to put food in our bowls in London? But he was really strong on that. He said, no, you, you have to go out, you have... Your job is to be the fourth heavenly messenger, you know, the, the sign of renunciation. So you have to go out every day. So that became a very strong ethic for us. I mean, again, we have adapted that a little bit over time. But uh, that's an, an ongoing, uh, say, question and um, something that we're working with, particularly with uh, uh, women in monasticism in uh, Asia. The, the nuns' position, particularly in Thailand, is uh, it's a very, very lowly position socially and the monk's position is very very high and so what we in, in in the buddhist world it's probably the most stratified of any buddhist country so that having come from our roots in thailand then that's a really big challenge to then have a f to have a form whereby the the women monastics have a a, a comparable status and comparable sort of uh, authority and responsibility within the community so uh, uh, Ajahn Sumedho had made some, some uh, very uh, sort of courageous changes and uh, adaptations back in the early 80s. And so um, that uh, is sort of informed the particular form that uh, we have for women, women's monastic training within our community. And so that's a, a very a area of very rich discussion and uh, ongoing uh, the, uh, dialogue between us and various different groups around the world. But uh, that was probably the most... Um, a kind of gnarly, to use a California term, <laughs> a kind of gnarly area of, uh, of uh, say, of working together. Because uh, back in that time, the uh, in the early 80s, uh, uh, we'd moved out of London. We'd been invited uh, to to move to the countryside. We'd been given a, a forest, and uh, they'd sold the house in London, and a, a house in the the country near the forest uh, was given and uh, was purchased for us. And so then Ajahn Sumedho first started carrying out uh, uh, ordinations. Uh, he was given permission by the Thai Sangha to be a preceptor. And so uh, he carried out the first monk ordinations. And uh, he, there were already some novice, no, novice nuns, novice monks, that, uh, ordinations that he'd done. So then, uh, so the first ordinations for, for monks were in 1981. And everyone thought, oh, Sadhu, Sadhu, this is all very good, this is great. And uh, <coughs> then 82 goes by, 83 goes by. So each year there's a few more men going into the, the bhikkhu life. Meanwhile, um, there are, uh, the women have been coming, they've been taking on the Thai um, uh, eight precept form for women's training. And very naturally, people who are supporting the monastery um, were coming and saying, well, this is great that all these men are going forth and taking on the, the, the monk's life. Uh, is uh, Sister Rojana and Sister Sundra Chandasiri, are they going to be in the kitchen forever? So, to his great credit, Ajahn Sumedho said, good question. Uh, that, 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 can't, that can't be sustained. That's not, that's not fair. That's not right. That's never going to work in the West, and we have to do something about that. So he then, he's a very reflective person, started thinking about it uh, and uh, discussing with uh, elders in Thailand. And so then he, um, over time, he got permission to create a 10-precept ordination for the nuns to to uh, uh, 
say, established what we call the Sila Dara ordination, so that gave the nuns brown robes. They, they have the ten precepts, they don't use money, they don't cook, they don't drive. And so it was a, establishing a renunciate form for women's monastic training um, uh, that was, say, acceptable by the Thai authorities and our, our Thai community, but also fitted in with uh, society in the West to a degree. And it's, it's kind of equally awkward on both sides, <laughs> so that the, the, it's, uh, it's kind of a bit too much for Thailand and not quite enough for the West. <laughs> but we live in two worlds. So that for the Westerners, like, mm, should be better. Uh, and then for the Thais, mm, should be better. So that probably tells us we've got it about right. <laughs> Obviously, things will ch change and they continue to adapt over time. But uh, that, I, I do a lot of what I call mindfulness of awkward feeling <laughs> as, a, as a practice. That, uh, yeah, this isn't a perfect fit, but we have got a 2,500-year-old a, a tradition. And it's... Even in Thailand, it's 800 years old. So meshing an, at least an 800-year-old system with a 21st century life, there's bound to be a bit of awkwardness. And so uh, I feel working in that spirit and doing the, the best that one can and having the, the, uh, the practical nature of the training uh, and living, uh, say, opportunities as the primary concern, that's the most important thing. So uh, uh, to speak a little bit about uh, a couple of other aspects then with, with respect to, uh, to going back to mindfulness, uh, I thought I'd read this little uh, piece. So I was invited to write um, a commentary on an article in um, the academic journal Mindfulness. So I'll, I'll read a few things out from this. And excuse me if this seems a bit tangential, but uh, I thought it would be a, a useful to be uh, um, aware, for those of you who are not too, so connected with mindfulness-based stress reduction and, uh, and this sort of field, and it, this addresses some of these aspects about the relationship between uh, MBSR and um, the ethical field, and also some of my comments about that, because I was invited to... The original article was written by Elaine Montero, who's from the University of Toronto, and her partners and then uh, they published my commentary in the Mindfulness Journal. So this is, comes from um, the, the article that I wrote. So, <clears throat> so John Kabat-Zinn in 2004 defined uh, mindfulness as, mindfulness means paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. Then this is my comment is, this definition is somewhat broad, and though useful, is open to misinterpretation or misuse. On this issue, Montero et al. commented firstly on the implicit rather than the explicit role of ethics in the teaching and practice of mindfulness. So uh, Montero says, uh, that this omission of sila may result in concepts such as non-judgmental awareness, fostering a range of negative stances from self-indulgence to passivity. And this is where, in the absence of proper teacher training, a poor grasp of concepts such as bare awareness, non-judgmental awareness, non-duality and so on are likely to misguide participants into bypassing their experience rather than connecting with it. Then there's a different section here, it says, the response to this central issue concerning mindfulness-based interventions, MBIs, from the founder of mindfulness-based stress reduction is significant. Montero, uh, again, Elaine Montero stated, reflecting on the choice to keep the teachings of ethics implicit John Kabat-Zinn states that each person carries the responsibility both personally and professionally to attend to the quality of their inner and outer relationships. At the same time, he indicates that this must be supported, quote, by explicit intentions regarding how we conduct ourselves both inwardly and outwardly. Further, Kabat-Zinn, in 2011, responds to earlier concerns about the exclusion of ethics by indicating that personal and professional ethical guidelines are intrinsic to the delivery of MBI, mindfulness-based intervention programs. He also argues that because there is a societal tendency to be incongruent with respect to inner and outer moral stances, an implicit teaching of sila is preferable. Okay, now I'll go into that a little bit, because you might have thought, huh, at that point. So, my comments are, John Kabat-Zinn's words here seem particularly carefully chosen. 
They're balanced on a tightrope between his acknowledged respect for the source of MBSR, quote, I've always used mindfulness as a placeholder for the Dharma, John Kabat-Zinn in 2013, and his intention to make MBSR as accessible to as broad a field of people as possible. However, what guidelines he gives are, from the traditional Buddhist perspective, they are significantly vague. It's my opinion. <laughs> The statements that, quote, each person carries the responsibility both personally and professionally to attend to the quality of their inner and outer relationships, uh, unquote, and that one should have, quote, explicit intentions regarding how we conduct ourselves both inwardly and outwardly, unquote, could comfortably be assigned to the fictional characters of Tony Soprano or Walter White. That's my comment. Uh, of even more concern is the statement that, quote, because there is a societal tendency to be incongruent with respect to inner and outer moral stances, an implicit teaching of sila is preferable, unquote. This seems to state that because there's a disparity between the ideals people hold and what they actually do, it's best not to talk about the subject at all. <laughs> if this is the correct interpretation of the comment, and again, from a traditional Buddhist standpoint, this is a very dubious principle on which to structure a, pedagogi a pedagogical approach and a system of would-be beneficial psychological practices. <coughs> so I confess I was having a bit of a rant there, <laughs> and I was wondering what John Kabat-Zinn would say about that, but he read it, and he was quite okay with it, to his credit. <laughs> so, but I felt that um, that sense of things being uh, implicit, it was so vague... And it kind of, and yeah, you know, Walter White from Breaking Bad, you know, who's a meth cook, uh, cooking meth and making millions of dollars for his family. Yeah, he's doing it on purpose. It's deliberate. He has, a, he has an intention in mind. He is surveying his internal concerns. Yes, uh, thousands of people are going to be, have their lives messed up by this, but it's worth it because this is what my family needs to survive because I'm dying of cancer. That's his ethic. That's the story of that, that whole series. And so, yeah, it was deliberate, it was thoughtful. Yeah, he's paying attention to the standard, and he's a meth cook. <laughs> so that, uh, I'm not accusing other pe you know, people here of having dubious lifestyles, but I feel that um, that kind of, uh, or like Tony Soprano of the, you know, the sort of mafia boss, yeah, it's just deliberate, it's intentional, it's for the family, and a few people get rubbed out along the way. You know? And that, that's... Uh, th those things are not insignificant and that I, I feel that, um, again, again, this is my uh, biased viewpoint, that, that if uh, there can be a way that our actions, our speech can, uh, can be guided by concerns of what has a beneficial result and a harmful result, then the five precepts to refrain from killing, from stealing, from sexual misconduct, from lying and from using intoxicants, those create a very helpful standard of, of conduct to help stop creating a, a trouble for ourselves and for other people, to live skillfully and kindly. It doesn't have to be a sort of a fiat from above, like you know, thou shalt not, as a kind of diktat from, from outside or held in a kind of, with a sort of Victorian moralism, but rather like you know, the, the law requires that you have effective brakes on your car. If you're going to be on the road, if you get pulled over and then the, the police want to check your, your, your brakes and they don't work, then you're off the road. <laughs> so similarly, uh, I feel it's helpful to think of, of these ethical guidelines in terms of uh, sa driving safely in amongst the, the other members of the, the, the traffic on the road. Another couple of things before I, I wind up I'd like to, to say in terms of challenges and possibilities and uh, again, going, kind of going back to what I was saying about sensitive dependence on initial conditions, that small things can have a big effect. So sometimes when we see how things are progressing, it's, it's like the books that are really popular, like the Dalai Lama's The Art of Happiness or, or Sogyal Rinpoche's um, Tibetan Book of Living and Dying, you know, million, million selling books, uh, or kind of large scale events, like if His Holiness is teaching and you know, filling up the Oakland Coliseum or, or the uh, kind of, uh, tens of thousands of people showing up for for kind of grand teachings or, or um, celebrations. Uh, the, these, these things can get our attention. Uh, 
and think, oh, that's a, a sign of, of major activity or that uh, things that are, are kind of large and grand and visible. But I would also suggest that the, the signs of, of Buddhist practice or, or important Buddhist events or events that really deeply impact the well-being of the society based on mindfulness and, and, and Buddhist teachings, they can be very small, they can be very insignificant. You know, so, for example, for the, um, yeah, for the, for the uh, monastic community at, at Abhayagiri, I was spending uh, the last 10 days up there, and for a number of the monks, the most significant thing about living at Abhayagiri is they've developed this method of making brown dye from manzanita bark. <laughs> it's like, wow, this is great, this is really important. And I'm not, I'm not kind of making a joke of that, it's like, that's really important. I thought, wow. You know, you're, you're dyeing your robes with trees that grow from these California soils. Yay! And that, so for some people that's more important than you know, giving a teaching to 20,000 people in, Oakland, in the Oakland Coliseum. Um, or just uh, tomorrow, a couple of the monks who are actually gathered here, are gonna, we, they're going to be dropped off on the way um, back to Abhayagiri, just let out of the, out of the van, and they're going to walk for the, the rest of the way back to the monastery, relying on, on arms from strangers. There's no... Uh, organized food given for them. We don't carry food, we don't carry money. Um, and this is not, I mean, many of our community members have done that. They're walking through the countryside, living on, relying on the kindness of strangers with no money. That, I, I realize that might be illegal. <laughs> <laughs> you might get stopped by the cops and told that you, you've got to have money on you, otherwise uh, you're going in the slammer. But um, we risk it. <laughs> but that, that, those kind of small things, or, or like, uh, Fifty years ago, uh, for the, the Chinese Buddhist uh, community, uh, Master Xuanhua led a, a, um, a seminar on the Shurangama Sutra in 1968. He, at that time, he was a fairly unknown Buddhist teacher, could hardly speak any English, and a, a number of uh, uh, very sort of hairy and bearded, uh, <laughs> long, uh, uh, <coughs> sort of, uh, hippie-clad uh, Buddhist students, most, in the most part, maybe some of you were there at the time, gathered around him and he had a, 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 a session for many weeks during uh, 1968. Other things were happening in the Bay Area in 68, as we know. But he had this, this uh, seminar on the Shurangama Sutra and that produced the first Westerners who became his disciples, his monastic community, which has many, many centers around the world. The largest Buddhist monastery in the West, City of 10,000 Buddhas, uh, sort of grew up uh, from that core uh, period of teachings, that, that kind of lit a fire. And who in San Francisco knew that there's this Chinese monk down in, the, uh, in this old mattress factory in the, in the, the, the mission district, you know, carrying out these teachings on a, on a, ch a Chinese text to a bunch of, of uh, dedicated hippies. You know? But yeah, that, that lit a fire. And then all these years later, there's a, a big effect that comes from that. So the, the last uh, little thing I'd like to say in terms of prospects, and I feel that Buddhist teachings and mindfulness, but B Buddhist teachings in particular can bring to society is a, a sort of a, uh, a kind of pet project that I have at the moment, is in terms of the goals of our life and what we look forward to, not just as adults but as children, what, what, what is put forward before our, our, our families as the possibilities for our human life. And uh, I realize people who come and listen to a Dhamma talk uh, uh, you know, on a, uh, a weekday evening when you could be doing all sorts of other interesting things, you know, you're probably a, it's a self-selecting group. <laughs> so people are likely to have somewhat less worldly goals than, than others. But for, for most of our society, what is there to look forward to apart from a comfortable retirement, making a pile of money, becoming famous as a writer or getting a lot of Instagram followers uh, having a, 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 a sh 1,500 academic, academic papers published or getting a Nobel Prize. Yeah. That, ta -da, that's the, the best we can look forward to. And for most of us who are not looking forward to Nobel Prizes or a 1,000 publications, at least having a good retirement home and getting your kids into a good college, that's the kind of the most that we look forward to and hoping that we don't have too much pain before we pop our clogs, as we say in England. So <laughs> fall off our perch or, or our life comes to an end. That's what we look forward to, that coping in a comfortable way and hoping that we can leave a little bit of a mark if, uh, if that's what interests us. That's what we have to look forward to. That's what the children are, are kind of educated to look forward to. And the most exalted people are the ones who are famous because of being movie stars or Instagram or you know, YouTube stars. 
and that uh, people literally die in the process of trying to get YouTube followers. Yeah. That's, that seemed to be uh, uh, probably none of us here. <laughs> but I feel that it's a, one of the, the most skillful and beneficial things is that we have a tremendous potential as human beings. Our minds can do more than just cope. We can be more than just comfortable. We have the potential to, to, uh, say, to say, develop the mind to uh, uh, qualities of excellence, qualities of freedom, qualities of, of joyfulness and, and peace and fulfillment uh, that you know, the Buddha defined in his teachings of uh, the stream entry, uh, the, non -return, the once return and non return and arahatship. And I feel that to some degree raising up those qualities of well-being uh, like the, you know, the, maybe in the DSM six, you know, they have <laughs> they have a section on stream entry. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, maybe there's any authors or editors for the, the DSM uh, Di diagnostic and statistical manual. That uh, I feel that expanding the nature of our view of well-being beyond just surviving <coughs> and coping and, and having a good retirement plan, we can do that, and that's that's something I feel that is a one of the richnesses of, of Buddhist practice that is that the message to us as human beings, to our young people, older people, we can do something with our mind. We can work with our mind. It, our mind is not just a neutral blank page, but we can work with our mind and it can be, uh, say, cultivated. The mind, the heart can be cultivated uh, to, uh, <coughs> to degrees of well-being, to degrees of, uh, say, uh, clarity and peacefulness and wisdom that are, are truly uh, wonderful and delightful and that we can really uh, enjoy our, our life and, be, and our life can be a genuine blessing to others. And I feel that the more that we can raise up that possibility, not as a kind of inflated uh, sort of ego, ego trip, but uh, I would say that it's not crazy to think of the idea of stream entry <coughs> as something that we could talk about in schools. Or that uh, that those, these qualities of well-being and human excellence, it's not just academic achievement or Instagram followers, or writing you know, uh, the, the, the great novel or uh, publishing thousands of papers, but we can develop our hearts, our minds, to qualities of, uh, of great, uh, great maturity, great wisdom. And this is a tremendous blessing for the, can be a tremendous blessing for the world. So I offer these thoughts for consideration this evening, and I'm happy to open things up for discussion. Sure, yes. Oh. What's the usual form here? Do you pass a microphone around or just put a hand up or what? Um, I have a question. Yeah, please. Um, um, hello. Um, I, I, I have been under consumptiveness for a while and I've built for another team with the homeless. Um, uh, I've been being text for a while and it turns out I'm confused between Chanda and Anha. <coughs> And I thought maybe you could speak a little bit more about it because sometimes Chanda is used for a wholesome states of mind, uh, but Chanda is not. <laughs> and in text it's fine, but when you practice it, it's very hard to differentiate between two. Like you would get hit by a desire and you go like, huh, what is it? So um, yeah. That's a very good question. You kind of almost answered the question in asking it. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, um, so for those of you who are not familiar with these terms, they can both be translated as desire. So the word tanha uh, is related to the Sanskrit trishna, which means literally thirst. So maybe the better word, to, an English word to translate it is craving. So that, because the English word craving has a sense of agitation and obsession and self-centeredness to it. Um, chanda, uh, is, uh, is desire, it's also translated as enthusiasm or zeal, interest. It's the, the mind's yes. It's the, the, the mind turning to an object and engaging with a, a positive and energetic quality to it. That, that the mind comes to something uh, with, a, with a, a, a kind of a, uh, an engagement, uh, a, 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 a picking up of that quality and a, an attraction towards it. So chanda, uh, not only is it sometimes wholesome, 
the Buddha uh, named it as a necessary condition, as a sine qua non of any kind of spiritual development. You need to be interested. That, uh, so what are called the four idipada, or the four bases of success, or the four sources of, of power, uh, idipada, so that if any task that you want to, to undertake, whether it's making breakfast, uh, sitting down to meditate, uh, cooking meth, or, uh, <laughs> or pursuing a degree at Stanford University, or, or teaching a degree course at Stanford University, for all of those, uh, you need these four qualities. And the first one is chanda. So you need to be interested. If you want to make your breakfast, you need to be interested in making breakfast. And so the, the first three of these four work together. So chanda is interest or enthusiasm. Then the second one is virya. You need to use energy. You need to, if you want to, if you, you're interested to have breakfast, but you're not going to get out of bed, <laughs> there's not going to be any breakfast, right? So there needs to be energy engaged. And, the, and then the third one is chitta, which in this, in this, in this instance it means thinking things through, re reflecting, contemplating, how, how am I going to do this? What needs to happen? So that those three work together, interest, energy, and, and contemplation, reflection. So whether you're taking on a degree course, or whether you're making your breakfast, or you're sitting down to meditate, um, then th <coughs> those three work together to say, OK, I want to meditate. Can I find a, a quiet place? Um, have I got other things I need to put aside? And, uh, and how much time have I got? And so forth. So then the fourth one is vimanksa. And that means uh, reviewing, or, or, or in a sense, recollection. It's, it's the, the looking back on the results of what you've done. So the first three work together as sort of initiating an action, or a, a project, or a thing that you're doing. And then the fourth one is, well, did it work? Did I get my degree? <laughs> yeah, does, is my, did, does my essay make sense? Uh, you know, I sat down to meditate. What's been happening for the last hour? Where, where has my mind been? OK, I, I was trying to become a meth cook. Did it work? You know, am, I, you know, am I succeeding? You know, and I'm de deliberately using a range of wholesome, unwholesome, and neutral. Because it, 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 it's uh, the four bases of success that they're morally neutral. They're, they're, they are, uh, say, they, they are apply in exactly the same way whether it's a morally uh, positive, negative, or neutral quality. So chanda, in that respect, is that motivating force. And that uh, it's a necessary condition to bring about any kind, do any kind of work. So tanha, uh, craving, uh, when we think of craving, then it's usually craving for food, or craving for a cigarette, or craving you know, sexual attraction, or uh, craving to um, get some kind of uh, sensory pleasure, you know, getting to the movies, or you know, such like. And so that's the most obvious or clearly delineated kind of craving. But in the, the Buddha's very first teaching, the, the Dhamma Chakka Pavatana Sutta, the turning of the wheel of, of Dhamma, he outlines three different kinds of craving. So ka, a karma tanha, uh, sensual desire, that's the, sort of the most obvious and clearly delineated one. But then it has two partners, which is bhava tanha and vipava tanha. So uh, bhava means to become, or that, uh, that sense of inclining towards, or wanting to be. So bhavatana is often translated as the desire to be or becoming, uh, the craving for existence, uh, the craving for defined being, wanting to, to be something, to be someone. So bhavatana, so like I want to get concentrated, I want to, uh, I want to be admired, I want to be a successful <coughs> academic, I, I want to be liked. So it's those um, more subtle qualities of craving, so that, that often in meditation, I want to get concentrated, I want to get insight, I want to, I want to develop wisdom. They seem to be very good things to want. But bhavatanha uh, always has that self-view element, that selfing element in it. Ahankara, eye-making, and mamankara, mind-making. They're, they're woven into it. And then vibhavatanha is the desire to get rid of. I've got this incessant chattering mind, I need to shut it up. I've got to get rid of my laziness, got to get rid of greed and fear and, and aversion. And, that a desire for annihilation. So I, I just need to stop feeling. If I could just get this thing to shut up. If, I, if only I didn't care. So that vibhavatanha, it, again, it's the, uh, it can seem like, well, in terms of following meditation advice, yeah, they tell you to let go of greed, hatred, and delusion, to get rid of your chattering thoughts. 
aren't I following the instruction? So it can seem like we're dutifully following the, the, the advice of the teacher, but that, that um, working with the mind in meditation, it can have been completely uh, hijacked, taken over, kind of the bhavatana, vibhavatana, sneak in the back door and kind of take over. Or oh, it's like a, a, a vi computer virus, you know, like a Trojan that sort of sneaks in to your computer and takes over the whole program. Um, so we can be, and, and this is a very, very common theme and uh, uh, some of the, the great anguish of people who have been meditating for many decades, maybe a few of us here, <laughs> that we've been putting a lot of sincere effort and doing what we think is following the right instruction, but trying to get concentrated, trying to get insight, trying to get rid of our defilements, trying to get enlightened, trying to get insight, trying to become a stream enterer. And the more that it's I need to become, I need to get rid of, the more it just compounds the sense of alienation and discontent and stressing. So, what to do, huh? <laughs> As my grandfather would say, my, he was German, my grandfather, so, what to do? <clears throat> so, the, um, the quality of right effort uh, that the Buddha speaks of in the, in the um, uh, say, the definition of the Eightfold Path, Samma Vayamo, then if you look at that as an example, so you have, uh, that again is in, the Buddha was very orderly in his thinking, so you have four elements of the of right effort. So you have, the first one is restraining the unwholesome from arising. Second one is if the unwholesome has arisen, to let it go. The third one is to cultivate the wholesome. And then the fourth one is the wholesome has arisen to sustain it. So restraining, uh, letting go, cultivating, maintaining. Now, you think, well, how's that different from bhavatana vi bhavatana? That sounds just like the same stuff, like stopping defilements from arising, or if they, you know, getting rid of them, getting rid of them if they've arisen, getting uh, concentrated, or, or developing loving kindness, or, or keeping hold of me, keeping hold of my concentrated state. But if you pay attention to how those qualities are phrased, uh, then in that development of right effort, there's no self involved. If, if uh, any kind of efforting and choosing and working was intrinsically stressful, how could it be part of the Eightfold Path? How could it be something that leads towards peace if it was intrinsically stressful? So there has to be a way that we can make effort and give direction to the mind and have a desire, a goal, and act uh, um, following that goal, giving the mind direction. That directly leads towards peacefulness, that is in tune with, with peacefulness. So the trick uh, is to learn how to make effort without there being me around. So that there is the, the restraining of the unwholesome. It's not me stopping the unwholesome from arising, but there's a recognition of anger or fear or uh, aversion and, and, cr and greed is unskillful. Let there be the effort for it to, to not arise. If it has arisen, let there, let there be the effort to let it go. So what drives that work, that effort, is mindfulness and wisdom. Again, in, in a way, this is where mindfulness very definitely comes into it. So that the guidance for action and decision-making is that mind's attunement to the time, the place, the situation. Uh, and that capacity to act is informed by the re recognition of what is wholesome, what's unwholesome. So mindfulness has an intrinsic sensitivity to the wholesome and the unwholesome. I would say that if it's a genuine, if it's mindfulness that's attuned, it's in tune with, with reality, with Dhamma, then it recognizes, oh, this goes towards conflict, this goes towards agitation, this goes towards confusion, let it go. This goes towards peacefulness, this goes towards clarity, okay, keep that one, keep that alive. And so that uh, there's effort, there's work being done, chanda is being applied, there's a direction being given, but it's not based on self-view. It's not, it's not based on uh, me trying to get something, but rather uh, it's the, the mind's attunement to the, to the living situation and guiding things in a way that are going to bring benefit for, for this being and for others. So I hope that... Thank you. That's the short version. <laughs> <laughs> I did a whole 10-day retreat on this theme a year or two ago. Yes, in the check shirt. Yeah. Okay.
Um, I have something to offer that might be difficult to hear and engage, and so I guess I asked for um, your flexibility in attaining the spot. Um, so my biggest concern about mindfulness in the West is the way that white supremacy can kind of get tangled up in how we view the teachings and how we understand the practice that we do. And this is something that I think about a lot. And so in hearing you speak, um, yeah, I'm feeling the impact of what I see as possibly being the harm of using words like um, cluttered or superstitious to refer to other forms of Buddhism that we don't have, that I don't personally practice mm -hmm. and that maybe, but maybe other people in this room have practiced or are connected to. Um, and of hearing you say something around the way that um, there might be this privilege that's conferred upon Buddhists in the future as if it's a PhD or something that's you know, looked upon in a certain way and that's not how it is now. And just seeing how that's connected to whiteness and white privilege and how um, there's you know, Buddhism has existed in the United States for over 100 years, and it's not new here. Um, yeah, I'm just feeling a lot of concern for how the mindfulness movements and how Buddhism can sometimes, yeah, cause harm in this way, and wanting to sort of like bring that up a little bit for discussion or consideration. Oh, thank you. Um, the, uh, yeah, that, um, the, 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 the clutter word, gets used a lot. And so, for one who lives in a, in a very clutter-filled <laughs> environment, and having a lot of respect for all those, those forms and customs, because, you know, I live mostly in the West, but we, uh, we're still very, very connected to our, our Asian roots. And so that uh, uh, there's a, a uh, I would agree, in, in, in many respects, there's a kind of uh, superiority uh, that, that can be, um, uh, uh, say, voiced in terms of looking at Asian forms and customs. And uh, there was a, a very uh, uh, interesting, so sort of ironically, uh, it, it's a kind of significant and slightly embarrassing incident where um, many years ago when Spirit Rock was about to be launched, um, and uh, they created, a, maybe some of you were involved, <laughs> they created a little promotional film about this new center that was opening up. And Ajahn Sumato had uh, just led a 10-day retreat at, uh, at the Angela Center. I was sitting with him. This, this was in 1990. And, um, so, and, and Jack Cornfield came along and, and uh, 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 had, no, it was, um, sorry, the, the, the president of, of, it was IMW, Insight Meditation West. Um, said, uh, asked permission, we, we're, we're launching this new center, can we have this, an opportunity to show this little promotional film to everybody at the end of the retreat. So then uh, the, the, we all sit there, and then there's Jack making the commentary, and uh, there's some sort of scenes of the, the valley where Spirit Rock is, and then um, Jack's doing his little introduction, and yeah, I'm not trying to malign Jack, I mean, we're good friends, but just, this is how it worked out. And so then the, 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 the film changed to film of, um, of uh, our monastery in Thailand, uh, and uh, the, the community the, of, of monks and nuns chanting and bowing and the large kind of golden-colored Buddha image and, uh, and Jack saying, you know, this is exactly what we're not going to be bringing to, to <laughs> California. <laughs> and, uh, and so this is the kind of, uh, sort of the, 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 the clutter of Asian Buddhism that we're, we're you know, the people are not interested in we're going to be leaving behind. This is a, a paraphrase. That it's probably not completely accurate, but it was along those lines. And, um, and so, uh, and Ajahn Sumedho and I are sitting there, you know, this is our monastery, our kind of, this is, this is our, our front, this is kind of our half, you know, the, 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 uh, and, and our, our people, our team, our, our community. And there's Jack's voice, you know, very sweetly saying, this is what we're not going to do. This is what we're not about. And um, <clears throat> so this was at the end of a 10-day retreat, and then the, 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 the fellow who was the president of uh, IMW at the time, uh, Howard Noodleman, you could feel him dying a thousand deaths as this was playing. He oh dear. He hadn't, he'd kind of forgotten what the film said. But it was, uh, you know, and Ajahn Sumedho took it in good spirit. It's like, well, that was embarrassing, wasn't it? That was the kind of ha, 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 ha. So he was able to kind of uh, meet it. But it was uh, incredibly condescending. And, that, uh, you know, that, uh, I, I'm a bit cautious about using the word white, white the term white supremacist, because... 
Um, but it was certainly elitist uh, in that sense of so looking down on these sort of a Asian customs and forms. And we're, this is the sort of uh, accretions to the to the Buddhist tradition that we're we're leaving behind. And this is going to be a sort of new uh, new Western Buddhism that we're going to be cultivating here. So that um, that a, a consciousness of that kind of elitism and and thinking, oh well. That's a problem that other people have. I don't have that. You know, and that uh, I'm not subject to that. that that's a, a, a danger in our society. You know, I didn't realize that how privileged I was in my, my life you know, as a sort of white, male, educated Brit. You, know, you, you come into the world assuming, of course, you're the top of the tree. You know. uh, this is what life is like. That, uh, you know, and then... You, you, uh, over time, uh, particularly living in Asia, living in a kind of rural society with a, like a, basically a non-financial economy. That, uh, it was a, when I first lived in Thailand in the 70s, it was a, um, um, uh, you know, a uh, farming economy that was uh, based on uh, subsistence living. That, uh, people grew the food that they ate and they didn't really used money very much, and, and it was extremely poor. There was no electricity in the village, no running water. Uh, it was a, a very, um, very, very simple society. And so then living in that world, and then that gave me a, 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 an extraordinarily sort of clear perspective on the privilege that I'd grown up with. And the, the way that I saw the world was not the way. <laughs> it was just what came out of a, 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 a kind of a... English public school educated lifestyle, you know, lifestyle, and that it was extremely different from the people that we are living with and the, the environment that our teachers had, had grown up in. So, yeah, I feel that, um, that anything that helps us to see that, uh, that the world that we, we, we are in is not the world, it's our version of the world, what we perceive is our mind's version of the world. And to recognize the limitations of, of our view, conditioned by our language, our culture, our age, our gender, our education, you know, all of that contributes to what we see and what we call the world. And uh, to the more that we can get a perspective on that and say, well, now this is just my mind's version of the world. It's not the world. So how does, somebody, how does this other person see it? You know, what, what's her perspective? What, where does uh, uh, where does the um, where does the truth lie? Just because I see things in a particular way, does that mean it's true? Does it mean that's the whole story? No way. So the the more that we can, in a sense, recognise that uh, our opinions can only be partial, kind of partial truths or, or convenient fictions, that uh, and that we get a perspective on, on that, then we're much more able to, say, respect and attune to the, the perspectives that others have. And I feel that Buddhist meditation can do a, a lot to inform that. And that uh, the, to reveal our biases and to, and to help us to have the humility to say, oh, wow, I never saw that. Yeah, that's extraordinary. So one of the... Um, the, the powerful experiences for me was when Abhayagiri Monastery first opened in the late 90s. Uh, one of the novices was a, an African-American uh, who'd grown up here in, in California. And um, he had been through um, a, quite a number of foster homes growing up. So his, his life and his sort of teenage years uh, couldn't, couldn't have been more, you know, more different than mine in many ways. He was a philosophy undergrad at the uh, university here in California, and he'd sort of, um, uh, gone on from that to come into the monastery. And so obviously we had a lot in common, you know, Buddhist monastics, but talking with him and living with him, his experience of growing up as an African-American male in, in California in the sort of late 20th century, uh, it was, uh, it was uh, so powerful uh, uh, to engage with him and to have him walk us through to what to the extent that he could what he grew up with and the, the world as it appeared to, even as a philosophy student you know, he said he'd go to a, a kind of 
faculty meeting and people would put their bags under their chairs and they kind of moved close to the door. So this is a philosophy department, you know. <laughs> I'm not dangerous. You know? <laughs> but still, that was that's what the kind of thing he grew up with. And the the um, the degree to which one could open up the heart and, and really empathize with uh, such a different world. I feel that uh, those kind of um, readiness to be informed and to, to, to have our, uh, our view changed or to, to re really appreciate to the degree possible other people's perspectives, that's an important part of our, our maturing. You know, what we have as a potential as human beings to the degree that we can. Also, uh, you know, I didn't realize how English I was until I came to live here in California. <laughs> I thought I was pretty liberal. You know. But a, a liberal Brit is, a, is a still an uptight Californian. <laughs> <laughs> I was just, uh, you know, I felt I was fairly sort of, you know, open and adaptable and, and liberal. And, and the, but the degree to, uh, uh, I'm seriously, it, it, was, uh, it was really quite an eye-opener, the degree to which um, people would just tell you everything about themselves within five minutes of meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and whereas I was a kind of um, freewheeling hippie type in England that was kind of very kind of open and flexible, I found myself thinking, oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> my, my kind of, my upper lip went stiffer. You know, and I kind of find myself tightening up. Like, what do I do with this? Yeah. And I thought, oh, I'm, I'm a bit more English than I realized I was. <laughs> So I, and I really appreciate it. I feel, you know, there's that ancient saying, it's difficult to be a prophet in your own country. And um, I feel it was a really a great blessing, a benefit to come out of my safe zone of being in, in the UK and coming to the place where there's very different mores, different standards of, of communication and, uh, and people were just that much more open and to, to challenge that and to... Uh, to find a way of being at home with that. Okay, maybe one more question. Yeah, one last one. Yeah, uh, so there is a lot of uh, importance given to mindfulness, uh, which is an uh, analytical way of looking at the world. Is why uh, the uh, concentration, the eighth step, is not given importance as you know, mindfulness, because in a uh, whole brain we have. Uh, analytical part and uh, synthes I mean, synthesis in unifying the uh, world also. Why we are thinking only the mindfulness uh, given importance than the concentration part? Um, I think your guess is as good as mine, <laughs> in some respects. I think the, uh, the, at the moment, mindfulness is sort of the mot du jour, the kind of, it's the kind of hot topic of the time. And particularly because of, of that, uh, the effects of, say, the work of people like John Kabat-Zinn and um, the, uh, the people who developed uh, mindfulness-based <coughs> cognitive therapy. So that's had a big impact, so that that's, that's something that's had a, a, a very um, visible and, uh, and beneficial effect on many, many people. So it's got people's attention. But uh, I, I suspect that as time goes on, then... Uh, and people's interest develops, then they'll, they'll, there will be more of a looking into these, these other aspects of Buddhist teachings and, and traditions and the forms that are, are available. In, in terms of the uh, Buddhism coming to, uh, to the West through the, um, in a sense, not through the immigrant Asian community, but through the, the interest of Westerners learning from the Asian teachers, so that you have a so, say the earliest Buddhists in this country were the Chinese community for, uh, uh, involved in the gold mining, and also the sort of indentured labor in, here in the Bay Area of you know, Chinese laborers were brought in. They, they created their own temples back in the 19th century. Those are the very first Buddhists in the USA, um, and so there's, you have the immigrant Asian communities um, that are sort of carrying on the traditions from their home countries, but they're the Westerners who developed an interest in Buddhism and so were learning from Asian teachers, the, the main thing was meditation, and uh, um, particularly the aspects of concentration and, and insight uh, that come from meditation. So 
teachers like Gawenkaji in, in India, or Mahasi Sayadaw in Burma, Ajahn Chah, Ajahn Buddhadasa in Thailand, then uh, the, the, uh, the key uh, to the, the kind of the linchpin of interest and the, 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 the cause of people's <coughs> attention and effort and time uh, being spent on listening to those teachers and practicing their, 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 uh, according to their advice was around meditation. And so that, that has been a very strong presence since the 1970s in, in the Western world. So it may well be that the meditation sort of becomes as, as widespread as mindfulness. Yeah, who knows? Um, my, my own little kind of shtick on, uh, on ethics is that um, where my mindfulness-based stress reduction was, was sort of launched in the late 70s and became very more popular in the 80s and 90s. And then uh, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy for depression became you know, popular in the 2000s. Then, uh, then the compassion element became sort of introduced later on. So compassion is, is kind of the new hot thing. Uh, <laughs> mindfulness and compassion. Self-compassion or compassion for others. So my hope and my, my kind of... Uh, uh, say, aspiration is that then uh, mindfulness-based behavior therapy, otherwise living according to the precepts, <laughs> will, be, will become the new hot thing. That people will discover if you stop telling lies, you'll feel much better about yourself, and you'll be less anxious. You know, it, uh, that uh, wow, look at that, amazing. You know? If you don't steal things, you won't worry about being caught. Wow, I'm, I'm kind of playing it up a bit, but. I, I do hope and I, I suspect that there will be a, along the way kind of a, as an extension to compassion that compassion for yourself and compassion for others if you don't kill things, if you don't steal things if you are responsible in your sexual relationships and you're honest and, uh, uh, and uh, say uh, discerning in the, the way you form relationships and, uh, and if you are careful with your speech and you refrain from lying and, uh, <coughs> and such like then you will find yourself far more at ease and able to uh, say, live a life that is, is peaceful and beneficial for yourself and others. And then the fifth precept, uh, that has a special place insofar as it helps the first four to stay alive. I'd like to think of the precepts as like ring fencing the reptile brain. And if you're familiar with the Jurassic Park, you know, the trouble really begins when the fence comes down, you know, <laughs> when the, uh, the raptors and the get, get through the boundary. So uh, drugs and alcohol are what knock down that, uh, the wall that keeps the reptile brain contained. Uh, aggressive uh, and uh, ac uh, uh, acquisitive uh, impulses are kind of greedy and, and deceitful impulses, self-benefiting uh, self impulses. The, the precepts help to create a little ring fence that, <laughs> that uh, contains those. And when we drink or use alcohol, uh, use alcohol or use um, you know, mind-altering drugs, and that can knock a few holes in the fence. And then the reptiles, th those reptile urges have much more leeway. Uh, any, uh, any of you who've ever had a few drinks will probably not argue with that observation. I was a serious drinker before I was a monk, so I have direct knowledge of, uh, of uh, the free, free running of the reptiles. <laughs> So uh, I think we've now gone past 7.30, so I think this is probably yeah, a good moment to... Are, you know, many more questions. I would like to ask you about stream entry, but I fear the answer might take us past midnight. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm not good at short answers. Yeah. Uh, so I think we'll just have to invite you back another time. But uh, for this evening, thank you very much. And, and join me in thanking others.